Greetings students and welcome back to another video on special relativity. In this lecture we're going to derive the equation for length contraction and solve an example problem, so let's begin. Suppose I have an observer A standing stationary on a train platform. The reference frame of observer A is R. Now since observer A is stationary, his velocity is zero, the reference frame R is inertial. Recall that an inertial reference frame is a reference frame with constant velocity. So a stationary reference frame like R has a constant velocity of zero, making it inertial. Suppose also that I have a train moving at a constant velocity of V to the right, and inside this train is an observer B. The reference frame of this observer is R prime. This reference frame is also an inertial reference frame because it's moving at a constant velocity. Say that I put a source of light on the left edge of the train like this. And let's also put a mirror that's opposite the source of light on the other side of the train like this. Let's call this distance, the distance between the source of the light and the mirror, let's call this distance L0. And L0, also called the proper length, is the distance between the source and the mirror that's measured in the reference frame of the source and the mirror, the moving reference frame R'. prime. We'll see that the length measured in the reference frame R is actually different from L0. That's the whole idea behind length contraction. Now when observer B exactly lines up with observer A, what we'll do is we'll set the clocks in both reference frames to zero. So the time in R is Ti equals zero and the time in R prime is Ti prime equals zero. The I is just a subscript for initial. As soon as the clocks in both reference frames are set to zero, we'll have observer B switch on the light source so that the light source fires a ray of light towards the mirror. Let's now make two new point of view drawings. We'll start with the point of view of observer B, the observer who's in the train that's moving along with the light source in the reference frame R prime. Now according to observer B, when the light source is switched on, the ray of light travels across the train, strikes the mirror, and then travels back to the source. This is pretty common sense. If you shine a laser on a mirror right in front of you, the laser is going to travel to the mirror and reflect back. Observer B isn't moving anywhere with respect to the source and mirror, so this is what the situation will look like to him. According to observer B, the speed of the light ray is c, which makes sense. The distance the light ray travels is 2L0 because it goes 1L0 to the right and 1L0 to the left. Therefore, the time taken by the light ray to go across the train and then come back is 2L0 over c. I'll call this equation 1. Observer B was pretty easy to understand, but let's get real empathetic and look at things from observer A's perspective. So observer A is standing on a train platform at rest with respect to the ground. In A's frame of reference, the source of light and the mirror are moving at a velocity v to the right. I'm not going to draw the rest of the train, just the source and the mirror to keep things simple. After a certain time delta t1, measured in the stationary reference frame r, the ray of light will have hit the mirror on the other side of the train. However, in order to hit this mirror, the ray of light will have had to travel the length of the train L, according to observer A, in addition to the distance V delta T1 that the train moves forward. Therefore, the time delta T1 for this first part of the journey is the total distance traveled by the light ray L plus V delta T1 divided by the speed of light C. Recall that C is constant in all inertial reference frames, so light will appear to travel at the same speed for both A and B. The length L measured by observer A, however, isn't necessarily equal to the L0 in B's frame. The length L measured by observer A, however, isn't necessarily equal to the L0 in the reference frame of observer B. That's the whole point of length contraction, and that's why I've used slightly different notation for the length in the two cases. Now if we rearrange this equation to isolate delta T1, here's what we'll get. L over C minus V. Let's now look at the second part of the journey where the ray of light reflects back and reaches the observer again. Suppose that the time taken for the second part of this journey is delta T2. This time delta T2 is equal to the distance traveled by the ray of light, which is the length of the train L, minus the distance the source moves towards the light, which is V delta T2, all divided by the speed of light C. Rearranging this in terms of delta T2 will give us the following. Now the total time taken by the ray of light to come out of the source and reflect back to the source in observer A's reference frame is delta T1 plus delta T2, which I'll write as delta T. 
Plugging in the delta t1 and t2 we had earlier, we'll find that delta t is L over C minus V plus L over C plus V. And if we combine the two fractions, here's what we will end up with. And I'm going to call this equation 2. Remember back in equation 1, we wrote the expression for delta t naught, which is the proper time measured in the reference frame of B of the light leaving the source and coming back. Delta t is the time interval measured by observer A between the same two events. Can you think of how delta t and delta t naught might be related? Of course you can. We covered it in the previous video. They're related by the equation of time dilation. Let's plug in equations 1 and 2 into this equation for time dilation to find the relationships between the measured lengths of the same train in each reference frame. We can cancel the 2's to end up with the following, and then we can square both sides and isolate the L to end up with L equals L0 times the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. This is the equation of length contraction. According to this equation, the length components of objects that are parallel to the direction of the reference frame's velocity are contracted by the square root factor, which you might reason from the previous video is 1 over the Lorentz factor or gamma. Let me emphasize, length contraction only applies to parallel dimensions, not perpendicular dimensions. If I have a stationary observer A in a reference frame R and a diagonal object traveling horizontally at velocity V in a reference frame R prime, then according to observer A, only the horizontal component of the length will be contracted relative to the proper length. The vertical component, the component that's perpendicular to the velocity, will be unaffected. Only the parallel length component is contracted. That's why we were able to derive the time dilation equation in the previous video without transforming the length between the reference frames. It's because we used a perpendicular dimension for the distance, not a parallel dimension. Let's solidify our understanding of length contraction by going through an example problem. Suppose I have two trains A and B with the proper length L traveling in the same direction, with train A going at 0.8 C and train B going at 0.6 C. According to a neutral observer O on stationary ground, how long will it take for A to completely overtake B? In other words, my question is how long is the time interval between when the front of A passes the back of B and then the back of A passes the front of B, according to the observer O? Well, in order for A to pass B, it must travel the length of the train B in observer O's frame, which I'll call L sub B, in order to have the front sides line up. It must also travel its own length L sub A in order to have its back side line up with B's front side. And finally, it must also travel the distance that train B traveled in this entire time interval, which I'll call delta T. So this is the distance that A travels. If I divide this distance by the velocity of A, then I'll get the time interval delta t for this entire overtaking process. I can multiply both sides by VA, take the delta t term on the left, and then isolate delta t. If I do that, here's what I'll get. The rest of this problem is just plugging things in. V sub A is 0.8c, V sub B is 0.6c, so the difference would just be 0.2c or 1 fifth c. Meanwhile, L sub A and L sub B can be calculated using the length contraction equation where LA is the proper train length L times the square root of 1 minus VA squared over C squared. When we calculate this out, we'll find that LA is just 3 fifths L. And similarly, when we calculate the length LB in O's reference frame, we'll find that it comes out to 4 over 5 L. When we plug all of this into the equation for delta T, we'll find that delta T equals 7 L over C. And that is the time it takes for the train A to completely overtake train B in the reference frame of observer O. Anyway, that should do it for the video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan, signing out.